Hello everybody, Crit Crab here with yet another tale of Ross's stupidity. If you couldn't already tell by the title, it appears as though in this story Ross is either really stubborn, really stupid, or both, as they tend to go hand in hand. It is also oddly reminiscent of the first story in the Ross saga involving the Ghostbusters. If you haven't heard that story or any others of Ross's previous torment of his group, then you can check the description or the corner to see Ross's previous antics. But you in no way need to see what he did previously to appreciate this tale of Ross. Roll post. One thing I will admit to being absolutely impressed with by Ross was his ability to stick to his convictions. When he sets his mind on something, he will fasten a kung fu grip so tight onto it that no amount of reality will buck him off. He will ride his desires and delusions into even hell itself. I know this to be true as he dragged me into it more than once. The first D&D &D character Ross ever played was a teeny tiny Japanese ninja girl. The second D&D &D character Ross ever played was a teeny tiny Japanese monk cat girl. We never did manage to remember the name he had given to either character as they were just a mouthful of Japanese names that my brain mercifully refused to allow entry into my memory. It was just as well, because even though one was played in a second edition Greyhawk inspired homebrew, and the other was played in a third edition Eberron inspired homebrew, they were completely indiscernible from each other in any way, having the exact same personality as each other. Which is, to clarify, no personality. I would say they just had his personality, but that would be too generous a characterization of the sock puppets he ostensibly RP'd. No, Ross's personality began and ended with Japanese fetishization, Star Wars, The Matrix, and Gem and the Holograms, but that's at least something. The wiser amongst you, i.e. anyone that no longer eats paste, can differentiate between an interest and a personality, and may be thinking to themselves at this point, hey, those aren't personalities, those are just things someone likes. That would be like saying someone's personality was pizza or the smell of freshly folded laundry. And to you, I would say, you are absolutely correct, but shush, shush. I'm trying to tell a story here. Jeez. Being right isn't the point. Reality seldom found cause to impose itself into Ross's thought process. Ross found a way to make Gem and the Holograms a personality. It was outrageous. Truly, truly outrageous. But despite this metaphysical accomplishment, most of these personality features couldn't easily transition to D&D. So his character's personalities were just hollowed out versions of himself. Like someone had scooped out Ross's insides and made a frowny-faced jack-o'-lantern filled with melted cheese and sour cream instead of a birthday candle. We called them... Kitty. Despite this, Ross fancied each character in turn quite the tactician, and while I wouldn't call him Sun Tzu, crawling Kitty style has become a strategy synonymous with Ross's philosophy of combat and will survive through the ages, as a testament to his incredible tactical genius. I had blown up a large island. It wasn't nearby, but parts of the island nation rained down along the continent, sowing destruction and discord, as part of a plot we never got around to resolving and was a way of doing some interesting encounters. A treant with a magically tainted anvil embedded in its trunk as an example, in random and interesting places, submitted for the approval of the RPG Horror Stories subreddit, I call this story the tale of the dumbest tactical decision I've been privy. So imagine a church, not a big one, like a small country village church. Now explode that sucker. Imagine the roof blew off it like it was in a Donald Duck cartoon, and that the roof flew thousands of kilometers through the air before landing with a ker- <laughs> in the middle of nowhere, partially embedded into the dirt at an angle. So the front of the roof is jutting out and then slowly sinks into the earth towards the back. It's about 15 feet high from roof to ceiling at the front of the hole and about two feet high from ceiling to dirt at the back, kind of like an apocalyptic lean-to. And imagine, the denizens of said church are haunting their newly exploded dirt hut as ghasts. A nice little encounter, it should be straightforward. Well, 
my intrepid heroes, being the upstanding stalwart figures of a burgeoning legend, aren't gonna pass by a bunch of pissed off undead assholes and risk them spreading evil and whatnot in their stead. Understandably, they decide to go stab them. Roll initiative. Ross goes somewhere in the middle. The first few people up walk into the church and start with the fisticuffs. Then, along comes Ross. Never one to pass up an opportunity to ninja. Oh god, how I wish there was an occasion he would. He seized his kung fu grip onto a titillating idea, dragging us all into our own collective hell for the next few rounds of combat. With the careful measure of a grandmaster chess player, he announces the surefire strategy that will lead him to bingo. I don't play chess, but you shout out bingo when you get crowned, right? I'm gonna climb the wall, he says in triumph. Ross, buddy, why? From a standing hop, you can brush your fingers against the roof. Why on earth would you need to climb the walls just as combat is started? I'm gonna climb the ceiling and drop down behind them so I can surprise them from the back. Uh, um, uh-huh, okay, this was my fault, I figured. I hadn't explained the setup correctly. Ross isn't that dumb. I just did a bad job painting a mental picture. Let's back up a second and go over this one more time so that you can decide what you want to do. Ross listens to me, nods. I see he understands the words I'm saying, and the order I put them in makes my intentions clear. Great. Ross, what are you going to do? I'm gonna climb along the ceiling and drop down behind them so I can surprise them from the back. Okay. I'm looking around the table and seeing a lot of stupid glances being levied against an oblivious Ross. It's not just me. That's good. I was worried I was having a stroke for a second, but you know what? I get it. It's a weird setup. Even describing something sometimes can't quite convey an idea accurately. So I literally draw him a goddamn picture. There. That. That is what you have to work with. That little stick figure there? With the sticky lines over him? That's where the bad guys are. See this stick figure with the sword? That's where you guys are. See how much headspace there is the more you go in? Good. You understand now, yes? Alright. Now that we all are on the same page, Ross, please tell me what you're doing and don't disappoint me. At this point, I feel like I've correctly set your expectations in who Ross is and who Ross isn't. I just don't feel like I need to draw you a goddamn picture. I'm just going to leave a nice, long, blank space absent of words so that you can say it yourself. Okay? We're all frustrated with him together. Despite what a catty bitch I've been to Ross in absentia here in the subreddit, I've tried not to be an asshole in real life. Despite my feelings, I didn't mean to be condescending, but I was when I asked him, how the f do you think you'll sneak past them? The roof is four inches above their head back there. In hindsight, I think that was actually what caused him to tighten his grip. His stupid, stupid grip on that stupid, stupid idea. Like, no one's actually that idiotic, right? Like. Regardless of how well I worded the description or drew a picture, no one could actually think they could sneak over a group of ghasts in the middle of combat with only a four inch gap to squeeze through, right? It had to be that I offended him and that he was going to show me what for, like how a little kid will knock a birthday cake on the ground because if he doesn't get a corner piece, then no one gets any piece. A DM can't actually force someone not to be an idiot, so I accepted it. His teammates didn't. They took up the futile call to reason. Whatever. One by one, the table just kind of learned to accept that this was going to be a thing. Here's the thing about ghasts. They f***ing stink. You gotta make a save versus poison at minus two or start uncontrollably retching. Ross couldn't have been more aware of this as he had seen some of his comrades moments before fail their throws. Undaunted, Ross goes to climb the wall, and the predictable happens. Well, now he's got to make his climbing checks at a penalty because retching and gagging isn't exactly conductive to parkour. But if you think that a little penalty would prompt Ross to reconsider his decisions, maybe I do need to draw you a picture after all. So he starts trying and failing to climb the wall to reach the ceiling. In the meantime, combat abounds. Eventually, he gets up there, and then starts climbing upside down, and because I'm sick of arguing with him, 
I accept his reasoning that surely his ninja would have trained at climbing a freaking angled and arched ceiling upside down as part of her training. So I don't give him any further penalties. He's accomplished his goal, but it's about the time that he's hanging onto the ceiling, crawling along like an inverted turtle at their shoulder height when he gets huffy as I tell him that one of the guests attack. The gall of me. I mean, don't I know that he's climbing along the ceiling sneakily? He had asked if he could roll stealth, granted, and I did let him roll, but roll or no? I explained that all the stealth in the world could not hide someone being at eye level with the person six feet in front of them. And so, in a huff, he finally decides to just hop down and attack. The other thing about ghasts, they paralyze when they attack, and no, being upside down with all your limbs firmly planting you in place directly in front of the thing that wants to kill you does not make you harder to hit. Shocking, I know. So Ross gets paralyzed. Not that it mattered much, as combat ended the round after he dropped to the dirt like a paralyzed stone. At least he was involved in that combat. Yay. A couple of years later, and my friend Rod, who had been playing a cleric in that very topsy-turvy session, was DMing a game. I was playing one of my favorite PCs in my life of gaming, but that's a story for another subreddit. Ross is playing his cat monk now, and the party has just arrived at the brilliant conclusion that the old man wearing a black cloak who hired us to retrieve a book must, in fact, be an evil necromancer. The evidence was pretty conclusive. He was wearing a black cloak, and the paladin had detected something evil from me, and I was holding the book, so it had to be the book, I assured everyone. Because the NPC is smarter than us, he casts a wall of fire between us and him in the tavern as we're going to meet him, bisecting the room in two. As we're rolling initiative, we're all trying to figure out how to get to the necromancer, because that's what he totally was, I swear. Some are considering rounding the outside of the building. The tougher of our numbers were considering leaping through the flame. Ross wins initiative. I'm gonna climb to the ceiling and crawl over the flames. In that moment, everyone at the table that wasn't Ross collectively became one. For a moment, our minds found solace in the face of stupidity, and we melded into a hive mind and it was as one that five open palms smacked five respective foreheads in disbelief. Not this shit again. Rod quickly assures Ross that the flames reached the ceiling, and still Ross intends to climb the wall. Someone points out that he can climb the stairs to the balcony that overlooks the room to reach the ceiling instead of climbing the wall. And still Ross will climb. No matter how much reason and, and incredulity we levied at Ross, Unchanged was his conviction. But Ross's cat girl was at a much lower level than his ninja girl, and so when he went to climb the wall, unlike those years before, he failed and kept on failing. But failure wasn't an option for him, oh no, and so he kept trying. Something like four straight melee rounds, arrows and spells are being fired through the wall in either direction, and in the periphery of the firefight, <laughs> It was like in those cartoons, where a cat climbs up a wall or a cliff and then slides back down with lines of claw marks comically left in its wake. Except it was depressing. To our credit, one of our number eventually realized the wall of fire was illusionary, and that the necromancer had escaped unscathed and undetected. Right around the same time that Ross finally reached the ceiling and discovered for himself that he could not, in fact, climb over the flames. I'm not going to go over every instance of Ross's failure to climb walls during combat, but he never learned his lesson. And it didn't happen every single combat, but it happened enough. That's not the point of this story. They say insanity is repeating the same action and expecting a different result. Well, we kept letting Ross play with us and kept expecting him to not act like a total knob. No, the point of this story isn't to list every little quibble, the point is to express that some horror stories are your own goddamn fault. And yet, despite all that I've already shared, we still expected a different result. And to be fair, Ross never TPK'd an entire campaign before. We'll get to those stories in a bit. TLDR, stupid stupid keeps stupiding up the side of the walls. The walls aren't stupid though, only the ones stupiding up the side of them are stupid. And I still haven't gotten 
over it. <laughs> End post. Honestly, after this one, I don't really know how to feel about Ross or OP. Despite OP clearly stating that Ross is not mentally ill or impaired in any way, this doesn't really seem like the behavior of a completely neurotypical, ordinary dude. Also, is it just me or did OP seem a little bit overly critical of Ross? If it were up to me, I would have just let him face the consequences and be done with it, not complain about this seemingly mundane, if a little annoying, behavior on the internet. Am I justifying anything that Ross did? No, of course not. His behavior is still detrimental to not only his character, but the entire party, and it should be obvious that you need to keep the rest of the party in mind when you do something risky in combat. Also, there are a few comments stating that the plot twist is that OP is Ross and that's why he's so critical of things like this, and honestly, I wouldn't be too surprised if that turned out to be true. I guess we will all find out if there was a point to this in the next Ross story. If you enjoyed this video, please do leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more stories just like this one. Till next time.